he's our pastor, our spiritual leader. He is a blessing to our community. And he's so much to so many of us. I invite you to put your hands together and welcome our pastor, our speaker this morning, Reverend John the Beloved Scott. Good morning, family. And good morning, family, listening to us on the World Wide Web. And good morning, world. We are here in beautiful, rain-washed Jamaica. The sun is shining, the flowers are blooming, and our hearts are ablaze with love for all of creation. Yes? I just love that first hymn, Morning is Broken. And I have to tell you a personal story about it. About two years ago, I was in the immigration line in New York arriving early in the morning, and I'm there, it's a long snake of a line, and I'm singing quietly to myself, morning has broken, and an immigration officer passes me and joins in, like the first morning. He said, boy, you have, you know, if you're, you're in fine voice, and I said, you too. So, end of story part one, story part two, I get to immigration, and who is there in the, in the, the, the kiosk? Said, said singer in the duet. Well, my visa had expired by a month. <laughs> and nobody at the airline here had picked it up because I was, I'm an ex-airline person and so when I got to the counter I was yabbering away with the, the staff and they didn't really check all that well. And so nobody picked it up and there I am. And he says, where's your visa? I said, right there in front of you. And he said, it expired a month ago. I said, morning has broken. <laughs> Anyway, they, he, they treated me like royalty. He said, well, you have to come um, to go to the room. You know where they take you. And what time is your, is your next flight? And I, it was about three hours later. And he said, we'll try and get you on it. And I thought, OK. And they let me in, gave me the usual six months. And everything just went absolutely smoothly. They call it being on parole. I'll never forget that. Um, so my friends, when you have that song in your heart, that is the song of, of life, the song of love, so full and free, you don't need to worry. And you need to do what my encouragement this morning is titled, keep your eye single. Keep your eye focused on what it is you want to experience, on what it is that you want to see, what it is you want to be in your life and in your world, regardless of what is happening outside. You know, in my view, the gift of eyesight is one of the most wondrous abilities um, of our amazing human bodies. If you just think about your optical structure with its intricate retinal system, the rods, the cones, the adjustable lens designed specially to allow you to observe color and shape and, and form and the world around you, it's just truly, truly amazing and miraculous. And then you come to this teaching and you begin to learn about the working of the mind and you come to realize that the true sight is insight, or if you prefer, I call it eyesight, capital I, sight. And by the way, I just um, had the pleasure of driving in a, a new Subaru, and they call their new smart car, I suppose, eyesight, because it keeps you in your lane. If you're drifting out of your lane, it, it gets you back in your lane. And if you're rushing towards a wall at 70 miles an hour and you lose your concentration for a moment, it will stop you. It stops itself, in other words. It's, it's, it's really amazing. I think it's spelled like eyesight, E-Y-E, I think. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about eyesight, the inner sight. Um, but our inner sight is even more miraculous and more amazing because it does keep you in your lane and on target with your goals for unity with the one presence and the one power. And it stops you from, from colliding with obstacles that you don't necessarily want to collide with on your life's journey. In his Sermon on the Mount, the beautiful Jesus in Matthew 6, 23, 23 said, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee is darkness, 
how great is the darkness, unquote. You know, if I asked everybody here this morning to carefully observe the meditation garden after, after service and then to draw or paint a, a picture of it, the result would be dozens of different pictures with significant differences in the detail. Each of you would be seeing the garden with eyes that are physically more or less the same structurally, but each of you would bring to the assignment of creating a picture your own unique consciousness, your own way of seeing things. You would all have seen the same garden, but each of you would view it through a different frame of reference. Now take someone who is unhappy, for example. Such a person tends to see things that justify their unhappiness. The pessimist always sees discouraging signs, but the optimist looks at the same circumstances and sees the possibilities in them. Jesus says, and I quote, if then I be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness, unquote. But now friends, as we know, evil is not a thing of itself. It is not a power. No matter what anyone tries to tell you, there is only one power. What? God. God. And it is entirely good. So you know, when my fundamentalist friends, and I have a few, tell me that the world is under the control of Satan or some other diabolical force, I ask, so you believe there's a power greater than God? And invariably there's a long silence and they say, no, 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 but there can be no buts with God. God is truly the only presence and power. So what Jesus was saying when he spoke about uh, one being evil is that one's perception of life with all of its potential goodness, all of its glory, that that vision, that sight has been blurred or obscured by our fears or negative habits or negative thoughts and our belief in two powers. God and some other power. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there is no other power other than the one God. Can we just say together, there is no other power. There is no other power. So if you have allowed yourself to buy into the race belief that life is hard and that love is only for the lucky and the strong, then your cynicism will color the picture you see and the whole body of your life's experiences will reflect that negative perception. That's how the law works. Flip Wilson, a comedian of yesteryear from my youth, used to say, what you see is what you get. And he was so right. Not no, for you, it's my, in my cohort, my age group. <laughs> So, my friends, when Jesus referred to evil, he was talking about the concealment of good. That's all. Evil is merely the obscuration of good. When we come to realize this, we begin to understand that anyone who is unloving or violent or even unjust is actually a person who is good but who has never learned that truth about themselves, so doesn't know it, or has forgotten it. In a very real sense, we can change that person, at least as far as we are concerned. And to accomplish this, we must behold him or her with the single eye that sees only the good and the true in others. Now, this is, not, this is a, a tall order sometimes, but because we have to look past what their appearances are to see the divinity and the beauty and the, and the underlying potential and goodness that is there. The human tendency, though, to keep an eye on what we say we believe and another eye cocked for other possibilities is amusingly underscored in a story that I believe originated in the Far East, but I have Jamaicanized it. But like all good teaching stories, its message is universal. You want me to hear it? Yes, so a young man uh, spied a beautiful girl walking along Bamboo Avenue here in Jamaica in the parish of St. Elizabeth. And he followed her for quite some time. Finally, she turned and demanded, Why you follow me for? Uh, it translated into standard English, Why on earth are you following me? 
he declared earnestly, because you is the prettiest woman I ever seen in my whole life. And I have fallen madly in love with you at first sight. And with that, our suitor dropped dramatically to one knee and said, marry me not do, be mine forever. The young lady did what we call in Jamaica, it's a loud sucking sound. We call it kiss your teeth. <laughs> but you're not good. Make I hear it again? <laughs> you think you're so beautiful yet? Just look behind me and you'll see my sister coming behind me. She is 10 times more beautiful. So Mr. Romance wheels about and his eyes fall upon the plainest girl that you could find in all of Jamaica. He said, what, you take me for a heed yet? You, take your life, you tell me lie, man. She said, and so did you. <laughs> if you thought I was so beautiful, why did you turn around? <laughs> Jack Mandora may not choose none. So friends, what Jesus was talking about is here, we're learning here in, in the study of this truth. Because we declare that God is the only presence and power in our lives, but also give credence to the idea that there are some other power at work. And we turn around in fear that our finances won't hold out. Or we turn around in resistance to anyone we perceive to be a threat to our security or our position. Or we turn around in dread over every challenge that looms before us and eagerly devour all of the WhatsApp messages we can find about what's, what's going wrong, and we pass them on too, just because you know we want people to know um, what's going on in the world. I don't get any WhatsApp messages that tell me, well, not many, that tell me, wow, this is just the most wonderful thing. I just got one about the young man, a young, uh, uh, I think she was a cop, and she, and she shot a young man in his apartment and she was being sentenced. And you know, when they have sentences in the, sentencings in the United States, they have the family members come forward and say, uh, make, make a statement. And so of course, everybody, you know, I hope you rot in hell and you know, whatever. And this young man who was the brother said, I just totally forgive you completely. I don't even want to go to go there. You must know the pain you have inflicted. And my only hope is that you will give your life to Christ. And then he said to the judge, can I hug her? And I saw the YouTube. The judge agreed and she was brought forward and he stepped into the middle of the courtroom and, and hugged her to his heart. And they both wept. And it's made a big furor in the States because the people who want, who want revenge and you know all of that are not happy. But this was Christ-like behavior because he so totally forgave that I think a healing took place right there. And this is what we're called upon to do. It's not an easy call. I, I didn't see this, this on the YouTube, but I understand that the judge came down and embraced her too. So let us remind ourselves today that we are spiritual beings, my friends, and that the world is essentially a spiritual world governed by spiritual laws. Let us fall in love with this unchanging truth and establish our unity with it so that we don't turn around every time we think something better is on the horizon or something looming. We are on the side of God and we know that God is the only presence and the only power and nothing is opposed to it. When we recognize and begin to affirm that this world is essentially good, then that begins to be our experience. And the Gospels are full of of, of instances where Jesus the way sure did demonstrate that his eyesight kept him right in his lane and right on target with the divinity of people. When he said to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth thy hand, he was seeing the original perfection which allowed that healing to take place. So here is the great lesson to glean from the master teacher's teaching concerning the concept that man is divine. We can and must determine the level on which we are going to interact with other people and to do business with them. If we make contact with someone based on their appearances and how they seem to be functioning, then our relationship will be based on that level of consciousness. So we need to make certain that our consciousness is in line with what we want to experience when dealing with others. If you're grumbling, 
constantly that you just can't trust people these days. You are, or you are constantly saying that um, why people have to be that way or you, you have to deal with people who are irritating. I want you just to stop for a moment and consider that. that this is a hard fact to swallow. Your experience of them is the level at which you have called forth that from them. It is your level of consciousness that calls forth that. You could just have, as easily have called forth their higher, more divine, more, more noble selves if you had just, before leaving home, taken the time to say, everybody I encounter today is God's child, and I am one with them. Can we just say that? Everybody I encounter today is God's child, and I am one with them. Together? Everybody I encounter today is God's child, and I am one with them. So here's your assignment I just gave you. Before you do any business this week, before every meeting, every interaction, in fact, hear me, before you even leave home, I want you to affirm, I am established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Let us say that. I am established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Namaste. You are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Namaste. You are established in spiritual unity with God and with all people. Namaste. The Roman Catholic mystic Father Anthony de Mello tells a story of a writer who arrived at the monastery to write a book about the master of the, mon of the monastery. Quote, people say you're a genius, are you? He asked. <laughs> you might say so, said the master with a smile. And what makes one a genius, asked the intrepid reporter. The ability to see, said the master. Well, you can imagine the writer was betwixt and between, scratching his head with one hand and rubbing his tummy with the other. He muttered, to see what? The master quietly replied, to see the butterfly in a caterpillar, to see the eagle in an egg, to see the saint in a selfish person, to see life in death, unity in separation, the divine in the human, and the human in the divine. What an ability. What an eyesight to be able to look at everyone and everything and see it as God sees it, pure and holy and perfect and beautiful and awesome as a tribute to itself, the living spirit almighty. So our tasks, my friends, is to keep our vision single-eyed to the truth. Don't leave home without preparing yourself for the many human interactions you will have during your day. Remember, you can turn the focused laser beam of your spiritual insight on the world, and this will ensure that nobody, nobody determines how you act or react. Set your intention to let your light shine and to think, speak, and act from the highest level of consciousness of which you are capable. And if you encounter any apparent hostility or resistance from anyone, utilize your eyesight to put you back in your lane and to behold their true self, their divine self. And simply pause and take a deep breath and silently affirm, I am established in spiritual unity with God and with this person. That's it. You just, you just do the work. I am established in spiritual unity with God and with this person. And finally, I want to leave you with an experience I had yesterday which underscores the exhortation in Romans 12.31 that we be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Just yesterday afternoon, I, we had a, um, a practitioner's class here and then I had a quick meeting with Valerie about the hymns today. And then I went to the university hospital where I was with some friends in the accident and emergency unit visiting a family member of theirs who had been hit down by a hit and run driver. And um, the doctor said the prognosis was not good. So there are four of us in there and the doctor says, who is the next of kin? And they, it's pouring with rain as it was yesterday afternoon. And the, doctor, and the family said, well, she's not here. She just dashed home to, uh, to get something to eat and, she, and she'll be back here in about 20 minutes. No, you know. I don't know if you know, but when you're at the hospital, it's hard to get a hold of something called a doctor because they're so busy. And we said, are you going to be here? And he said, I'll, I'll try. 
Now, there are four of us in the, in the accident and emergency unit, and the guard comes across and says sternly, only one of you can be in here. The rest of you have to wait outside. Well, you can imagine how unhappy people were, you know. And by this time, the, um, the next of kin had arrived, but there was no sign of the doctor. So I said, okay, next of kin, you stay inside um, and keep an eye open for the doctor and we'll go outside. And so we, we, I, I went on my way out. I said to the guard, you really have a hard job to do and thank you for doing it with such compassion. And you could just see his shoulders relax. God, oh, not compassionate about what he did say to me. Anyway, I decided to see as God sees. We step out, out of the door of the accident and emergency unit just in time to see the said doctor chasing through the rain to his car. He was leaving. I shouted at him. He turned, saw me, and came back. Actually came back through the rain and went and met with the next of kin. And I just said to them, you see, we were meant to have been sent outside. We need to give a blessing to that security guard who was doing his job. But, you know, it's, it's really a tall call to, to keep in your lane and to see God, see God, friends, see God. Refuse to see anything but God. And if it look like it's other than God, just say, I'm not sorry, go. There is no truth in that. There is only God. And it's in every situation. It's in every aspect of your life. It is in every single encounter that you make. And when you do that, my friends, and keep your eyes single, you will find in the words of Stevie Golden's rhyming treatment in your program, and I quote, yes, I am the father's child. Seeming obstacles, challenges, issues are already reconciled. In the order that governs the universe, God's love and God's law, all is as it's meant to be. Spirit's creations have no flaw. That's about you, friends. Namaste.